then there was one best of three left to play on this Smite Saturday. We've had two O's so far here this weekend. Could our final set of the day go three? That's the question. We've seen convincing performances from the Oni Warriors and the Eldritch Hounds. A record being set at the beginning of the day. 13 straight set wins for the Eldritch Hounds. And we've talked a lot about how this final week of play is important for the standing. Still remains to be the case. Uh, over on the Chaos side of things, Leviathans and the Gilded Gladiators, they'll be fighting it out right now. This is a Leviathan's chance uh, not to completely confirm, but to solidify their spot as second seed over on the Order side. Gord, Chaos, si or, or, or Order side rather, still... Who knows? Up in the air. I was you, talking to you. Would you say the challenge. order side is in chaos? The order side is in chaos. The there chaos side is a bit in order. That one's for free. Uh, I'm looking at this one, though. <laughs> Leviathans versus Gilded Gladiators. Yeah, this would be a big one. Look, as rough of a phase as it's been for the Leviathans, we've seen glimmers from this team. And I think still being able to walk away with second seed, or a more stable-looking second seed from the chaos side, uh, would be a nice mental boost for the team. Yeah, I agree, right? I think for actually for both of these squads, it'd be a really good little mental boost to end things. The one that I'm looking at, and coming into this week, like the plus minus for these teams wasn't that different, right? And yeah. when you look at the standings, I think you can see, yes, they've been kind of following a similar vein, but minus seven for the Leviathans, minus eight, now technically minus 10 with the 2-0 the loss that the Gladiators yep. ate yesterday. So relatively neck and neck, I think that we've gotten to see a lot of good glimpses of greatness from both of these squads. And it's just getting that consistency. I think the jungle matchup in this one is like the matchup because everywhere else between these two teams has been I don't want to use the term lackluster, but I'm going to use the term lackluster because it that's what it's been, right? I mean, if you look at Solo... I'm not really, like, writing home about it in this one. You look over towards the carries. I think that that's a, an interesting matchup, but maybe not one that, that determines a lot. Mid, I think, at least holds a little bit more weight yep. into it. Uh, but I think that the supports in this one going to be somewhat important, but, but the junglers, I mean, by and far for both of these yep. teams, have been standing above and beyond everybody else in the lobby. And, girl, it's, uh, Gore, it seems fitting. In, in a world where we're talking about long SPL competitive win streaks, uh, Leviathan's jungler adapting was a part of, of one of those yeah. conversations back in the NRG days. Um, and, and so when you look at a lot of what has worked for this Leviathan's team and the moments where they are stringing together some of the wins, honestly, an Al Kwong game that I was reminded of after what Oath just did in our previous set, uh, ends up sitting near adapting and, and returning to, uh, to, to that high level of play that we know he can perform at and, and doing really well for the Leviathan so far this phase. Um, we'll see what Adapting has to say prior to this big matchup. Standing by for the pregame. Yeah, that's right. I've got Adapting Jungler for the Leviathans here with me for our pregame interview. Uh, adapting, kind of walk me through maybe, at least for the Leviathans, you know, it's been a bit of a struggle so far to start this phase out. Essentially at this point, looking towards playoffs to kind of improve into there. What are some of the things that your team is working on, not just for the remainder of this weekend, but moving in towards playoffs? Well, I feel like we've had a lot of things to work on, but right now we're just trying to kind of figure out our own style of play, figuring out how we want to play together and you know, starting to draft more of a style that fits us and kind of how we think we should play the game rather than, I feel like we've been getting caught up a lot in kind of what the meta is and just trying to play it a lot or like forcing picks that mm. you know, we might not have practiced that much. Um, and now with Chinto being here, it's made a massive difference in like our practice and everything right. where we're now able to fully start, you know, trying out these new comps and you know, see, we're just gonna keep building on that. Yeah, and now going up against the Guild of Gladiators, this is a team that's kind of struggled at the very beginning of the year. It took them a while to, to really get their momentum. What would you say is probably the strength of the Gladiators and something that your team may have to worry about going up into the set against them? Um, I mean, I guess the strength is like when they, if like they, they can play like the early game somewhat well. Like say if like maybe Kirmi gets off to a good start of the game, they can mm -hmm. maybe try and like leverage that and then try and, you know, to like kind of play around that as the game goes on, but you know, I'm expecting us to obviously contract that. Right. So uh, you mentioned how, you know, having Shinto here ha has made a big difference for your team. I mean, how significant on it, you know, on that scale of one to 10, you know, how impact, how like truly impactful has Shinto been now here in studio versus playing on ping? I mean, so last week we played, we only had one scrim and that's because he just arrived. And then now we've been scrimming like the entire week. and. You know, you can tell like the confidence is a, as a team and like him as a player, like he's really, you know, mm. showing what he's capable of and hopefully we're going to have a good showing today. 
Now, I'm just going to point out at least one little tweet that Zatman put out a little bit before this set went through, which was, yeah, the only Warriors go undefeated just to lose to us in the playoffs slash Masters. You kind of feel maybe those same sentiments as, you, as, your, as your fellow Hunter player over there. Of course. I yeah. think we can be the best and, we, you know, we have to prove it. So now this is the the upward trend for the Leviathans kind of moving forward. A little bit of a rough start, but now that we're getting closer maybe towards that playoff, that Masters, this is where you feel like the elevation now comes for the Leviathans. Yeah, definitely. All right, well, adapting. Thank you so much for kind of spending the time out here. One final prediction maybe for you as we kind of move through here. I think this is going to be a 2-0 for your team. You think this, may, this one goes full distance? 2-0. 2-0 up against the Gilded Gladiators. Thank you so much for adapting for coming out for the pregame interview. Best of luck in your set. We'll throw it back over to the desk. Gore, go ahead. You had some immediate thoughts. I've, well, I, honestly, it's just because I was looking up a lot of things for this set. And <laughs> I, I'm always, like really I always figure you are. Uh, there's a lot of fun ones, man. So adapting, uh, and you know, I mentioned the, the jungle matchup. I think the reason, and, and they should feel confident in this, really does come down to the fact I, I'm going to hit his first before we go into the gladiators. And it's just that he's one got a great KDA right now, right? 2.7, maybe not the most glamorous, but he's eight kills away from getting a hundred. He's the, the kill leader right now in the SBL. He got 23 last week. I think it was like 21 the week before that. So like, if you're looking for blood, look no further than adapting on yeah. top of that, being so close to the kill leader, he's also leading in first bloods. I think now because of that first blood that oath got in that last set, uh. He's technically one behind, but it was seven to seven coming into this. Now it's eight to seven. If you're looking for action, he's going to be the yep. one who's giving it to you on the, the Leviathans. Now, Gore, I think if we flip our talk to the Gilded Gladiators, you could say yeah, something similar about Kirmi as well. Because Kirmi, look, he, he has spearheaded a lot of what the Gilded Gladiators have been doing this year. Now, we've given a lot of credit to Kirmi. Yeah, he, did, he deserves. He straight up did not look good in the set yesterday up against the Oni Warriors. Panatom um, just, just kind of ran around. And really the Oni Warriors did in general. You can't lay all that at the feet of Kirmi. Um, but if if I'm putting my my eggs in the someone is going to pop off this game yeah. basket, it's probably Kirmi. But it's, not, it's far from a guaranteed thing. Um, that said, this matchup between one of the more killing players on the Gilded Gladiators against one of the more killing players in the league and, and adapting and comes to the forefront. I would also say that, you know, you got, like you said, in adapting one of the most killing players and one of the most killed players in this. And the reason I had said this earlier was, like, support as well as jungle is going to be a big matchup is because, you know, you look at the Gladiators. Stu has the highest KDA for the team right now, 3.2, looks really solid. Kirmi's stats were just up on the board. You could see about 22 kills behind adapting. He's actually only two deaths behind the most deadest player in the SVL this phase. Do you uh, have which the, is... um, the average time spent dead on there? I know we do for some gods. I just, I've always thought that was a really fun fact, like the random this player has been <laughs> yeah, dead. Yeah, <laughs> well, the, we have, yeah, no, I've got you for that one too. Uh, Scary D. Yep. And Variety, yep. both tied at 3 minutes and 33 th seconds. Average time. Average time spent dead per game. Hmm. Uh, inbound, unfortunately, I'm going to have to throw him under the bus here, and it's just because lowest KDA in the league, right, a point nine, got 70 deaths to his name. Kirmi's just behind that. And if Kirmi's going, you know, 70 and 68, kind of shows you he's getting in there, getting active, but usually having to trade his life for it versus, you know, adapting with a 2.7, the 92 kills all of a sudden really carrying a lot of weight. And, and so – even though, you know, adapting is actually tied with Rong Yu for, for most deaths on his team. Yep. 48 to 70, right? I mean, you're talking about a 22 big separation between them. Numbers-wise, the Gladiators struggle, but then you start to look at a few other things. And that's like, Kirmi's right behind adapting in terms of first bloods. You, you talk about well, what we've seen in, in a lot of these, and even though his KDA maybe doesn't match up, all of those kills have been really impactful. I mean, we talk about that one eight and nine game. I think we were talking about it yesterday. Yeah. Go talk about that a week ago. And it's a game that they're losing, they're losing, they're losing. And then Kirmi drags their butts back into it and gets them right back in there. And ends eight and nine, doesn't look glamorous, but gets the job done. That's what Kirmi has been providing for this team. And when you watch the stars align for everyone else, it makes it a lot easier. It's just getting the stars aligned. Yep. That has seemed to be the, the big issue for them. This will be the last set of the phase for the Gilded Gladiators, currently at two and seven, looking to improve out of three and seven. Leviathans will have our first set of the day tomorrow up against the Jade Dragons. Where I think... If I, if I look at the bigger picture here and I talk about how important this set is for, for really both of these teams, honestly, standings-wise and seeding-wise, it is important. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're talking about potentially second seed in this in this division being up for grabs. 
but, but mental for the Leviathans, feeling like you're finally putting something together. I think uh, a big one for the Leviathans uh, to step into here. Gladiators trying to, to get everyone here in studio, and yeah, we know that that's been um, a long process for a lot of our players. I think for the Leviathans, and maybe some of it's on us, but a lot of the conversation we've had around this team is just Shinto hasn't looked like Shinto. Is that because the team around him is different? Is that because he's on ping? Well, now he's here in studio, and so it's time to see that type of growth. Um, and so again, you know, even even in a matchup that's not contesting for first seed, I do think there are a lot of storylines to follow along with. And picks and bands will tell us a new set of stories. Hebo, Yamoja, we hate water on the uh, on the Gilded Gladiator side and of things. You know, I love water, so I think we're gonna have an issue. Here. My mother would say it's the elixir of life, and she would be right. But Gilded Gladiators uninterested in hydrating or allowing the Leviathans to hydrate. Sir Ket and Knox banned away by the Leviathans on the other side. And huh. Sir Ket becomes less and less surprising the more yeah. we talk about Kirmi and his stats on that god. That is the most banned god against them. It's actually tied with Marty up there, right? Something that Stu has looked really good on in the past. Wouldn't be surprised considering what we've seen from these teams if it, it has either first picked or uh, at least locked in here. Uh, for a ban, but Sir Ket's been up there. The thing that really catches me by surprise, you know, like Knox actually hasn't been that great for the Gladiators, but it's been some of Inbound's best looks, so I understand where it's coming from, even though win-wise uh, doesn't match. Hell has also been a very popular ban against them and has been able to support a lot of the numbers that the Gladiators have. The one that catches me by surprise is, you know, Hebo's the 10th most banned against the Leviathans, Yamoja's 5th. Kind of jumping, I think, a little more beyond, leaving things like the Vamana open. Merlin has been, I think, a, a huge pick for both of these teams. But when you're first pick, you've got a little more leeway for it. Thor is also one of the most banned gods against the Leviathans. So I think that what you're looking at the Gladiators is trying to deal with what is adapting, had a late game turnaround on, Hebo. What is wrong you just absurdly good at, Yamoja. And Rocky what do we not want to deal with <laughs> adapting on, Thor. It's just a, a really good trifecta. Marty plus Afro, to some teams in this league, Gore, may be considered the most sought-after one-two that you can start with. But remember, the conversation we've had around Aphrodite, 44% win rate. I think the win rate hasn't proved in recent weeks, but it's because I think the teams that hadn't been winning with her stopped picking her. And now it's just been left to the handful of teams in this league that really feel like they can put together really good performances. Could that be wrong, you? Well, he's one of the best supports in the world for a reason, so I got to give him a level of confidence. Whereas the Gilded Gladiators, it feels like also have gone pretty standard and straight from the tier list. And, yeah. Uh, they got Vamana, and Twig nearly drags the team forward along with Big Man Tings in our previous set on the Vamana. Plus Terra and Merlin. Good start from both teams, I'd argue. Yeah, honestly, you get something, like you said, that's, uh, I think, very clean. Afro worries me a little bit just because of what we've seen some of these teams you know you see your win rates starting to skyrocket again from that 29 28 percent we had talked about a few weeks ago uh, and that's just because a lot of the teams that were losing with her stopped playing her gladiators leviathans and i guess in this case more relevant the leviathans might struggle a little bit with it definitely something i think to, to keep your eye on not a pick they've gone to a lot though is this the first? If at all, actually. Is this I don't the think first this is... Aphrodite game ever for Rangyu? Yeah, we have not. Well, at least we haven't gotten to see it. So now I'm excited to see what he can do. I'm sure he's played Aphrodite at some point <laughs> in his life, right? I don't know. I, there's been quite a few times where we've gotten someone who comes in here afterward and they're like, yeah, no, never even played it in scrims. Like, just, just thought it looked good, so I picked it. <laughs> yeah, but I'm assuming they've, you know, played it in, like, arena or something. Um Nope, this is the first time Wrong Yu's ever played Aphrodite wrong, well, ever. Wrong Yu and the rest of, like, the, the if you look at the OG Leviathans, That's played right. so much they played Smite. played so much Smite, right. It's they more I think time he on each probably god. has more time on each god than, than even people who've been playing since Season 1 have in the game. Yeah, I, I wouldn't <laughs> be surprised. Um, so it looks like the first competitive game of Aphrodite we'll see for Wrong Yu. Morgan Susano. Uh, this is rounding out to be what I, you know, what I expect a standard Leviathan's composition to look like, except the Aphrodite. Um, but again, I, I still think Wrong Yu and, and the support play that he's put on in the past, you have to give him just a little bit of credit. Hachuman and Rom both survive the first wave of picks and bans, but do not survive the second. Now it's up to Stewart, who will not have the Marty, nor Hachi, nor Rom. But CERN's still around, Ishtar's still around, a couple picks that he likes just fine. 
That'd be Fenrir and Heimdall Gore. We'll complete the composition for the Gilded Gladiators in game one. And you know what? I, 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 <laughs> what? I think it's really interesting. I hope you'll tell me. Last set we saw Heimdall locked in. I saw someone in chat go, Coast has a Heimdall? And the first what? thing that went through my mind was, dude, he's from Europe. That guy's got a Heimdall. Yeah, <laughs> like, right. Every single person who's played in that region has a good Heimdall. But to see him, I, I mean, I think Heimdall still fits well enough in the meta, right? He, he does a lot of things that you see from some other carries. He's relatively safe. He's got decent and sometimes bonkers damage. I think now that crit is starting to wane, he really gets to step in because I feel like he does great in metas where he doesn't have to worry about crit. Sometimes we've seen those massive like 1k crit hits uh, plus on people, but I feel like his consistent damage with his attack chain and how much they wallop people, I feel like he's in a really good spot to, to kind of hold his own, stay safe. Plus his ult is really good if you want to go for a 1v1 or if you need to, to disengage. So I think that Gladiators put themselves in a position that if you're looking for not just KDA play, but I think good damage play, Heimdall's going to slot in well. Gore, the question is, Yeah. are there obvious Morgan transformations for you going into uh, to this game? I think there's some, there's some good options out yeah. there for sure. Is there the obvious one that we're, uh, that we're so used to seeing? I think there's one that stands out as obvious to me would be Vamana. Yeah, Vamana. I think Vamana yep. in, in this instance is probably the best in the lobby to transform into just because of what he's going to bring to you. If you are ahead of him, if he's fallen behind, he's still going to be able to stomp and click on heads. And if he's ahead, then yeah, naturally, he's going to be one of the best ones. He's really hard to kill, really good in the ultimate. If you make that transformation, you're going to feel fine. But I do think you have some other options, right? Terra's ult is really nice. Probably not where you're going with the Morrigan, but that at least is open to you. If your team needs a team fight, if you've been kind of struggling, especially in like the healing department, that might be able to, to give you that lift. Vamana takes the cake over that one for me. In fact, out of everything the Gladiators have, I think you got to go Vamana. The only other one that I would maybe like lean towards would have to be the Susano, Susano and that's just yeah. because assassin dive get in get the job done fits Morgan's play style on top of that so if you de transform while you're that deep two typhoons from your team plus that kind of dive damage and then still dive and damage from a Morgan while you're out there it could really kind of line up to itself she's relatively good at getting out of uh, and peeling for herself right invisibility yeah. good stun so that's another option but i think Vamana is up there by a large margin. Yeah, well, it could be the option. <laughs> yeah, and there's use cases for 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 everybody. The other gods. I mean, Nike could be a really good Nike, jump in we've and, seen and just double slow Cthulhu bomb. compositions. I feel like when teams haven't been able to get the Cthulhu in the past, Cthulhu plus Morgan, they I, I feel like we've seen a Cthulhu Nike composition once or twice, or like Nike on your team if the other team has Cthulhu and yeah. you can transform into one or the other. Uh, maybe options for the mid lane for the Atlantis Leviathans. Leviathans versus Gladiator are our final set of the day kicking off. Thank you so much, Dave and Gore. Game number one between the Gladiators and the Leviathans and potential seeding implications on the line for these two squads fighting for that second seed spot here in the final week of the SPL regular season path to Masters. It's J-Mac, Trelly, and Doug here to bring the action for game number one. And, Charlie, I immediately want to go over towards this Nike because yep. so far this season, we've only really been seeing Nike jungle from Sino on the Ferryman. Haven't really been seeing it go over to the soul lane. What do you think maybe kind of elevates the Nike in the soul lane for this composition of the Leviathans to try and squeak out a win? Uh, what elevates it? <laughs> yeah. What, 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 what's you know, fine okay cooking? Yeah, you know, what's fine okay cooking on, the, on this Nike? You know, is, is this – is this some sneaky good tech, or is it, he's just thinking, man, Nike just sounds good? I mean, I, I I can tell you, in my personal opinion, I've never said Nike sounds good. And because of that, I don't know what Final K is going here. They, they have, I guess, some knockups. Maybe he wants to immune out, and he's got the shield. I mean, Nike's good for diving Merlin, sure. But Sunder exists. He's got a rough time late game. I think Final K has been trying a lot of different picks recently, and maybe that's just for the sake of trying new things. Uh, it's got a decent matchup into Vamana. You're not going to care about the knockup. You're just going to go even in farm. But I would say most of the top solo laners can just go even with Vamana. You don't really care about him in lane. That's not why you're picking the Vamana. So uh, I'm going to have to see. I'm going to have to watch and see what Final K is cooking. Because again, Sunder, I think, just makes Nike a non factor late game. You think maybe you could even be playing into a little bit of what I was talking with adapting? He's saying some of the strength. At least this Gladiators team is the ability to kind of get active really early, get those early scrappy fights going through to try and win out. Maybe the first 15 to 20 minutes to, to kind of 
get themselves closer to that late game for themselves. I think maybe some of the picks that were selected here by Leviathan's got to help to counteract up against that. Well, they've got decent late game. They, they've got just fine early game as well of adapting's able to, to find some aggression. I do love Shinto on the Morgan, a pick that I think is still extremely strong despite the fact that we're not seeing it as much. You know, the, the double Cthulhu meta is, is ways behind us, but I think, you know, as long as you have a decent transformation like the Susano or even the Nike in this case for safety, you're going to get value, and I think Shinto knows that, so should be just fine in that regard, but... Again, it's not like a composition in today's day and age is going to scream to me, oh, we need, you need Nike here. Like, that's going to be OP. It's just a, a decent in lane, great poke, and of course, you know, you're going to have good dive late game as long as you're not constantly just getting sundered and having your shields dealt with. Dual lane going back and forth for these two. Stewart on the Heimdall, something that we at least saw from Coach just earlier on in the set worked out really well for him, something that Stewart's gone back to as a comfort pick multiple times throughout his SPL career. Let's see how he and Inbound can hold out against Zapman and wrong you over in that duel lane. Inbound on this Terra as well is something that he picked up just recently. At least in this phase, it's worked out really well for him. A lot of great CC, trying to lock down some of these maybe more mobile targets. Some of these ones that can kind of zip in and out of these team fights and really cause some havoc when it comes to these jungle team fights. In this case, not too much action just yet. We've seen Adapt and go towards Snoopy twice now. Sort of hide in the jungle, see if he can find a pull. Or at the very least, try and pull a beads right before level 5 when Shinto can get an easy transformation and find a solo kill. But not going to be a purple buff invade. I've seen inbound die on this exact invade a few times where you go just a little bit too far, you chase the buff down under tower, and you end up overstaying your welcome. So probably smart that he decides not to go for it. Will be a 50-50 for the shield buff. Terra's got some great confirm. And it looks like they will be able to grab it. The Guild of Gladiators, that is. Scary D, forcing on the Colossal Fury. He does this so much. Yeah, he does. He ults for the totems, try and get aggressive, but look at his build as well. The Tainted into the Tier 2 Breastplate. No Golden Blade in sight. Probably fearing how much damage could come in his way from Final K and adapting. Said, hey, you know, I can clear the wave just fine. I'll miss out on some gold, but I don't want to get I don't want to get camped early. I don't want to get too far behind, so I'm just going to go for that Fizz Prot as soon as possible. Almost right on cue, adapting rotates right, but... Seeing that Scary D's under the tier 1 tower with an ultimate down. Not much that Susano can do, even with the help of Fine, okay. And then ultimate the shielding there. So a passive early game to start out for both these two squads. A little bit of boxing in the dual aim and maybe a first potential pick. Kirmi has rotated over. Stu throws out the ultimate on landing. Kirmi will be able to go for wrong you. Doesn't even need the ultimate damage. It is a first blood for Kirmi, the player who gets the most active here for the Gladiators. Yep, no ultimate, no undying love. Had the Ragnarok if needed, but did not need it. So Kirmi makes a great call on top of a, a, a perfect ultimate there from Stewart just to set up that gank. It's going to be first blood here for the Gladiators getting off to a great start in duo lane. Question now becomes, will Adapting try and counter, or will he just decide to fight? And I did not expect Frostbound first item on what? Nike. I mean, I said it. What's he cooking so far? I don't know. It's We're pretty cold. Yeah. We'll, we'll see, though. I mean, this Nike could be disgusting, right? He could just rotate into a fight, and just those auto attacks are disastrous. Final K's been able to get some pressure over in solo with it, I suppose. But not going to be that tanky, right? And, you know, the shielding, again, you, you want some protections. You want to be able to survive after you get sundered. I am so curious as to what is going to come from this Nike. I just I want to see rotations already. Yeah. You want to see Final K get active. See what he goes through there. Power, health, no HP high and 85, but then those slows, at least from those basic attacks that go through, probably the most impactful part of it, it lets you keep a lot of chase. Is this the now, first time inbound. we've seen the new Frostbound? Uh, no, actually, Sop picked it up yesterday in game number two, one. Picked up in one of his games. I think it was game number one yesterday for the Oni Warriors, and went, went along with a, a Bumba's Hammer as well, which I think was the first sighting that we've seen that, at least this phase as well, so... Not the first game, but certainly the earliest we've seen one picked up. Whoa, Stuart! What? Stu, with the <laughs> Stu, are you okay, bro? <laughs> He's laughing. He definitely did not mean to teleport in. He's going to take some damage because of it, but adapting's nearby. Doesn't seem like he wants to try and dive the tower. Yeah, that's what, that's what we call a, a, a missed teleport there. A rare miss, but still, you don't, you don't want to be by frosting in, especially with that low of HP. It's almost like pulling an Ishtar, where yep. you dash instead of popping your, your snipe shot. Mm -hmm. Inbound. 2v1 by himself and just being annoying to Zatman and Rongyu. Maybe even try and steal one of these buffs away if possible, but he 
He's already used the wall. He'd have to use dash in order to take this one, so. Leviathans will drag the purple buff away and inbound. Will come up empty-handed. Maybe lucky for him that adapting isn't nearby in the jungle. Could have maybe been a collapse on the inbound. Shinto versus Snoopy. Oh, Snoopy boy. might not be making it out of this one. The Typhoon is down and the slams from Shinto on the Nike. Will strike a kill now for Leviathans. Can Scary D get anything? It's him versus three. Once that ultimate fades away, Scary D will have to turn tail and run. Leviathans are finally on the board. Yeah, you never want to find yourself in the jungle with two Susanos. That's just, that's just not a good time. Snoopy falls down, loses the beads. Merlin has taken some poor pathing. I mean, it, it, it's it's clear wave, under tower, green buff. That's as far as you go. Those mid camps are just so deadly, especially with stealth from Shinto and, of course, adapting, using that blink to close gap. Merlin just doesn't have the, the damage or the, the self-peel to try and escape from two Susanos in the jungle. And of course, some rotations in for Final K as well. So here comes Kirmi once again, looking for Wrong Yu. Back to the duo, waits out the Undying Love, goes for the pickup, grabs Wrong Yu, and brings him right back to his own hands. It's a second kill for the Gilded Gladiators. And number two now for Kirmi, just lather, rinse, repeat for a duel in gank. And I don't understand that play because I get it. You don't have beads, and you're 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 afraid that Ragnarok displacing you is gonna kill. But you can you can just ult. You know, even if you get picked up, you don't you don't have to try and immune that bite. Just really worried there. I got it wrong. You tries to time it, but Kirmi can make that play whenever he wants. He's just gonna bite, 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 miss on purpose, and eventually he's gonna you're gonna panic ult. So I think Wrong Yu's gonna have to watch his positioning even further now. Two deaths this early on doesn't bode well here for the Leviathans, but at least Shinto got off to a good start. Shinto getting a kill certainly helps out. And that was something that was talked about with adapting this. Now that Shinto's here, feels a bit more confident for his team. Feels like improvements are going to slowly be made now that Shinto has made his way back with the rest of his team here live in the studio. We'll have to see how Shinto and the Leviathan's overall improvement is tracked over the course of these next couple of sets for themselves. So Atlantis Leviathans, they need the assistance. They need... Some of that extra boost as they start to make their way towards playoffs. Because realistically, out of order division, or uh, sorry, chaos division, only warriors they sealed the deal last week. They don't have to worry about any. But he's trying to take away their first seed spot. So all these teams on the chaos side fighting for that second seed, fighting for better positioning once playoffs comes around. In this case, that's all this is, right? You're con you're considering a practice. That's what you have to considering it. And no one is close to the only warriors positioning wise or gameplay wise so far playing the map which means you just have to take as, as much practice as you can leading up to Masters, which I think both of these teams do need to try and figure out exactly how they want to play the game and, and, and their style of picks, that sort of thing. But Gold Fury's up. I mean, there is pressure to be had on the left side of the map, but most junglers, I mean, Kirmi in particular, has been sitting on the left side of the map pretty consistently, whereas Adapting has been avoiding the duo lane, if at all possible, trying to get farm, look towards ganks, towards Snoopy, but besides that, just farming up and trying to get this Transcendence online. Which Susano does appreciate, of course, but you think has some room to get aggressive. Without the Doom War, I'm wondering how quickly Shinto can really rotate around the map. You know, the, the Morgan meta builds have has sort of been shifting. I guess now Conduit Gem to help you out with your early clear. You don't really have Doom Orb for that movement speed, but if you're able to turn into the Susano, you still do have some, some ease of access trying to get to the duo lane. That's going to be it. Just some ward vision down. Mostly Leviathan's favorite towards gold, but no team feels confident enough to make a pull. Fine, okay. Another odd item in the build. Something we don't see as much anymore. This is old meta. Especially for the solo lanes. Sovereignty picked up. You're going against Kirmi Scary D. Double physical. Makes sense you get a little bit of extra physical defense, but maybe that aura once late game turns. Getting that extra HP 5 for your team. Those extra physical prots. Maybe that's what he's looking towards, at least that point. Says, you know what, I'm not going to do anything early. So maybe I start building towards late game. Says, fine, okay, since really not much action has happened over in the solo lane. It's all been dual lane for the Gladiators, and it's been everywhere else now for the Leviathans. Inbound drops ultimate. Quick dash away, quarter HP. Adapting goes through. Ultimate Typhoon does hit two, but it's Kirmi versus Zap and Wrong Yu, and Kirmi's losing this trade. He's forced out, and Shinto can't close the gap on the Nike. Kirmi will make it out of this fight. But can inbound, can Snoopy get out? Adapting goes back in. The transform and the dash through. It's going to be a 1-1 trade out. Shinto misses the sun on Scary D who transforms up and is batting away at what little health that Wrong Yu has. But the healing is just enough.
Jacob, he and Shinto alive, maybe for only a moment's notice. The turn and burn, Shinto is out of mana, Rong is out of mana, it's gonna be fine, okay, who's got a peel for these guys, gets the slow on a scary D, and that's just enough the to get Shinto to go through, and the Frostbound procs, the knockup is there, but stunned by inbound, now bails out scary D. You know, looks like scary D's got out, but now inbound could be in some trouble if Final K is able to get the slow. Doesn't seem like it's going to be enough damage unless some more cooldowns come through from Zapman and the jump will be able to confirm no. it. So inbound dies for the sins of Scary D and Shinto lives to see another day. Beautiful engage there, but the question is what does it turn into? It looks like the Leviathans want a Pyromancer and unless Snoopy can get here, it's going to go down. Got a feel for inbound on a play like that. It makes a great wall, great stun. To stun out two, allows Scary D to break his way back out, but then just gets tier one towered Dove, loses his life, and then a Pyromancer immediately after. And Lance Leviathan's keeping this game dead even up against the Gilded Gladiators. 3-3 in kills, basically no gold difference between the two, and experience right on the money as well. This is close to an even game here at 12 minutes as we get, but... Might go the opposite way now with the Guild of Gladiators starting up Gold Fury. Leviathans have got to answer fast. Shinto's got ultimate back up. All ults available on the map. The Gold Fury is reset. And Scary D diving into the back line. Does have Colossal Fury. He's got to use it, but he's already a quarter HP. As soon as he goes up, and it's Zatman in the sky, raining death from above. It's not enough damage just yet, but maybe Shinto's Vamana can chase him out. Says, I'm the better gnome child this time through. Shinto takes down Scary D and Kirmi running for the hills, but a typhoon will catch him out. Yeah, but it looks like that should be a free fury there for the Leviathans. They get the better end of that trade. Shinto finally makes a different transformation. I mean, number one was the Susano goes perfectly. Number two, if he was Susano, actually would have been able to confirm that kill, but transforms into Nike, has no sort of range damage, can't finish it. And this time says, you know what, I'm going to try out the Vamana. And this one ends up working out very well. That Colossal Fury lasted for such a long time. Chinto gets his third kill of the early game here, putting the Leviathans even further in the lead. Both objectives have been going their way. And uh, Kirmi, th this has been the, the Fenrir build, right? Just so much prot, so much protection. You're sort of just an old bot, but it really does seem like the Guild of Gladiators need a bit more damage online, especially with Stuart building so much towards late game, going the kin size early on. It usually means that you're just not going to be able to fight in the early, right? Snoopy's going the, the flat pen build, but Shinto is the Morgan with Conduit Gem and can transform into just about anyone. The early game damage heavily slanted in the favor of the Leviathans. What is fine? Okay, going next. I'm not even Talisman. Tal Talisman of energy? Yep, I mean, sure, Pestilence is fine in the Terra, but I just feel like he's going old meta through and through. All right. We'll keep our eyes on where Final K goes on item number three, and honestly, the entirety of his build is kind of a question mark. It's worked out so far. Wait, hold up. He's going all the auras. That's it. Oh, he's okay, got so Heart Ward for yeah, this one? he's going to go Heart Ward. That's got to be it. He's like, wait, Nike buffs the team, Saab buffs the team, and, of course, the Heart Ward buffs the team. I can, I can make an argument for every item in that tree just because of how he started the build, but it looks like it is going to be the Pestilence more so worried about the amount of healing that's coming from inbound. Inbound. Not going to be getting very much sustained back. Shinto has to transform right back into the Vamana. And he's going to turn and fight right back. Now Kirmi on the run. He's got no now he's beads. staring at his own Vamana at this point. But Shinto gets picked right back up by the Ragnarok. And Old from Wrong Yu saves his life. And Kirmi running as fast as he can. Inbound. Now Zoni fights the root on three. Scary D is now shown back up to the party. He's got his own Colossal Fury. Typhoon means absolutely nothing to him. Kirmi takes down one. Scary D with one of his own. And now two down for the Leviathans. Yep, Scary D's ult is going through, and Zapman had the rotation, but decided not to make his presence known. Loses adapting and Shinto. That would have been a lost fight regardless there for the Leviathans. The Guild of Gladiators finding their own their own times to get back involved in this fight. Shinto, a little bit over aggressive, tries to turn it on to Snoopy. And Kirmi waits it out perfectly. He says, Alright, I know your beads are down. You're gonna eventually turn back into the Morgan with no beads, and I'm gonna be able to pick you back up. Good piss from wrong you though the undying love was able to get him out of Fenrir's mouth this is the benefit of that Vamana you can tank up tower that Colossal Fury is going to last a long time and Scary D able to get just enough damage to confirm both of those kills scrappy game so far 16 minutes in and we're essentially tied I mean 5 to 5 sure gold a little bit in Leviathan's favor because of those objectives but the Guild of Gladiators have shown they're okay with fighting even a little bit down so the Guild of Gladiators now Making their mark over by Pyromancer, potentially. 
Kirmi starts the pull. Inbound on zone duty. None of the Leviathans nearby just yet. Wrong you on the way, but can wrong you out secure Snoopy in this case. Pyromancer to the Gladiators. Rink Bomb picked up by Kirmi. Disarmed there by Fine OK. But no follow up from the Leviathans. The Gilded Gladiators can notch another objective under their belt. And maybe a tier one tower. Stewart's going to stick around this left side. He can knock down these Bastions and work towards tier one, add a little bit more gold to the Gladiator's pocket. Yep, Stuart's got nothing to fear, at least for now, unless Shinto decides to go from that chess camp over towards the Heimdall, but all Stuart has to do is use his first ability. He's going to know exactly where Shinto's at. He's going to have that vision. He's not going to have to worry about getting the soloed anytime soon, especially with both relics up. He can just teleport out any given moment. So the tier one tower does go down, and we're essentially setting up for another Oni Fury here. It looks like... Both teams are going to group. The Leviathans are a little bit further away at the moment, especially with Adapting channeling his back and Final K over towards FG. And they might be too little too late. The Kilda Gladiator is already here. Stewart is swinging on this Fury. Snoopy is melting this one down. The burn too strong for the Kilda Gladiators. They notch yet another Fury for themselves. This will be their first one, Oni Fury. For the Gladiators, a couple of Pyromancers have been taken throughout this game. And now, maybe our first significant lead of the game, Charlie. About 1,700 gold up for the Gladiators. 2K experience as well. And most of that XP, at least falling over towards Stuart and Kirmi. About a level up for the two of them. And Scary D, actually two levels up on the Vamana. This pig's been working out really well for him over in Solo. Yep, doesn't need the, the Golden Blade, I suppose. If you get all that attack speed from the Shoguns and the Berserkers. I guess the movement speed wasn't something that Scary D found necessary. Because of that, he's been able to get some pressure over in lane and just rotate towards these fights and do exactly what you would expect from a Vamana. But with both of these objectives down, it is about time we start seeing some rotations over to the right side of the map where a Fire Giant could take place. Stewart actually finishes the full Odysseus bow, so this Heimdall will be swinging some AoE damage for sure, considering that attack speed. So that man hasn't really been able to match the the itemization here of Stuart, because this is a full ability-based Marty. He's got the Transcendence, the Soul Eater, and the Crusher, so certainly swinging, but a full item down because he was holding on to so much gold. And is only going to be able to buy the Tier 1, or Tier 2 Morningstar, so working on a Heartseeker, just can't quite finish it yet. Yeah, it might be a moment before we see that come online for Zap. But now where would the Guild of Gladiators go? With Pyro still down for a minute and a half, Gold Fury an extra minute beyond there. Unless they can find a pick, I don't think Fire Giant's under the conversation for the Gladiators or even the Leviathans at this point. A five, or I should say a four-man stack by Leviathans in mid. Maybe opens eyes a little bit. Stewart rotates over. Charlie, maybe we will be seeing the potential to try and go for one of these picks, get set up for fire, because it's one of the farthest points that Stewart has rotated over on the map, has been towards this Tier 1 tower in mid, standing right behind Snoopy, but... Maybe realizing the Leviathan's either nowhere to be seen or no one to maybe be able to pick out here. Stuart will head back left, and the Gladiators just continue their farm. Yep, Stuart said, hey, you, got, you guys need me? No, nothing's up? Okay, I'm going to go back to farm. And I think this does benefit the Gladiators for the time being, just because they've got consistent split push, and, you know, Scary D's getting the better end of trades over on right lane, but Stuart is up against three on his own purple buff. Does have to teleport out. Will Beads, Will Aegis. And barely makes it out alive, adapting. Had the teleport option, but decided not to take it. Probably a smart call. Stewart still had his ultimate and does good damage, but loses both relics, and that's a big deal. Heimdall without relics, it's a lot more difficult to try and use that Bifrost defensively. And maybe Kirmi wants the 1v1 versus Zap. Zapman takes down tier 1. Scary tries to teleport over, but it is stopped by Zapman. Now Kirmi versus Zap. Ult for ult, traded through. Kirmi will not continue his chase. Scary D, though. Might not let this one go as freely. He actually blinks all the way in. Will continue his dash through, but now he's running into both Zapman and oh. Adapting. Misses the slow, only gets the damage. Gladiators, they lose out on Tier 1 and now use both Relics for Scary. Yeah, but now the question is, did Scary D just stick over here? Or Pyromancer is the call. This is actually great here from the Gladiators. I was going to say, with Scary D over on the left side of the map, you could be losing some farm, but the Leviathans take the bait. They rotate over to a Fury that's not available. And the Gilded Gladiators are able to just pull that Pyromancer for free. Get an extra Runic Bomb there for inbound. That's going to work out just fine. Unless the Leviathans decide to get a pick right before the Primal Fury spawns in. That's a win for the Gladiators. Full collapse in by the Leviathans. Tier 1 tower taken out. Fine, okay. 
on the wrong side of that tower, but able to jump away. Kirmi goes in. No ultimate available for him just yet. He's taking not a whole lot of damage. This tanky Fenrir style of build is letting Kirmi sit in the back line a little bit longer. And now the Guild of Gliders, after losing Tier 1 tower, don't have much left to, but to retreat as Primal Fury spawns back in. The Leviathans already setting up for an inbound who didn't go back to base. Could just be getting picked off here. And it's adapting to notch number six on the board for the Leviathans. Yep, inbound steps up to face check the Primal Fury and ends up biting it. Now Primal Fury starts up, and there are no Gladiators left to go. I do see a little bit of a grouping towards the right side of the map, but there's no way they decide to pull an FG, especially with Scary D over clearing right side minions. And just in case the Leviathans did show up, they didn't have Ward Vision down, so had to face check it themselves, and the Primal Fury will drop. I do like... What the Leviathans have been able to do so far, Shinto hits level 20. Matching that of Scary D who also ticks over to level 20. So some good farming from both of them. But the question now becomes, who's feeling more confident to make a pull on the Fire Giant? Neither one of them really have crits, so it's going to go down slowly regardless. But confirmation, probably in favor of Shinto at the moment. He could transform into just about anyone. You can use your, your ultimate from Susano just to time at the perfect moment with a poly shot, something like that. There's a few options they could use, but still, it's a relatively even game. I mean, even with these objectives going down, J-Mac, not much is changing. Map state, you're just trying to get to late game. Snoopy hasn't done much fighting at all. He's just been able to finish his build. Karan's going Soul Reaver, that sort of thing. Can't really finish a starter on him because he doesn't farm as quickly as Shinto. But the Smerlin is still a threat if grouped up properly. And as far as objectives go, I mean, a couple of Pirates, the Gladiators versus you know a couple of Furies. For the Le Leviathans at this point through. One extra tower down on the Gladiator side of the map, that being the one over in mid lane compared to Leviathans, where they're still holding on to their tier one tower. A fire giant pull by the Gladiators. This could be risky. Scary D and Kirmi have got to do some major work to zone them out. Wrong you is here. Final Kane Shinto now on the way. This fire is not taking a lot of damage. Shinto transforms into the Vana. And will immediately run back in. He's batting away at inbound. Is now turning sights to Stu, but he's getting melted by Snoopy and Stu. Shinto, one more shot could take him down. It's Kirmi who finds the kill in the fight. Wrong you low. Kirmi and Scary D now dog piling on top of Wrong you. And that's one more for Scary and one for Snoopy. And the back line is adapting, and Final K's dive goes unsuccessful. Yeah, Scary D just finished Hasten, if you were curious, and he was able to just slam away in that ultimate. All the while, Stuart was popping off. 0-0-7 oh, oh, does not tell the tale of how much damage his Heimdall was able Stu. to do. He really was slamming. And now a full-on reset means that the Guild of Gladiators can walk up towards this Fire Giant. And unless Final K has something to say about it, we'll go down, I'm assuming uncontested, because the beads were used in that last engagement. Final K doesn't have ultimate. And there's a ton of CC on the side of the Guild of Gladiators that could just make this Nike's life miserable. But Final K is still here. It looks like he might attempt to steal. Got a couple of tools to try and do so. It doesn't seem like Final K is willing to risk his life stepping up into the pit. So Lance Leviathans losing out on this fire giant. And there goes all five for the Gilded Gladiators, who have now turned this game back to their favor. 2,000 gold up for Leviathans. Not much at this point in the game. Because, I mean, Charlie, from 12 minutes in, 16 minutes in, feels like every four to five minutes we check in, the gold goes from maybe tiny lead back to even. But maybe now our first significant jump. Kirmi might be getting caught out here, but oh. able to join the rest of the team. Wow. Typhoon off the mark. Final K finds the leap onto just Scary D. Final K pops the shield with his ultimate in the back line. Now it's Scary D up against the world, and Scary D slamming through Final K. He's going to solo him out at the end of the day, and he might not stop there. Adapting chase out. Scary D. D transforms, and now will be rejoined by the rest of the Gladiators. Kirmi going to solo out Pyro. Well, the Gladiators. Finish their push on right before heading back. I thought it was such a pe peculiar play there from Kirmi, right? He's so tanky on this Fenrir, yet he decides to juke out the Lovebirds from a full tank Aphrodite. I was like, just run through him, right? But nope, Kirmi recognizes, hey, I'm going to die unless I stay out of combat. Jukes the Lovebirds and is able to blink all the while. Fine, okay. Goes way too far. And Scary D. This is what that Vamana does. Stomps away. Surprisingly, despite... The, you know, the, the, the HP style build that Final Case went for. Not very tanky. Doesn't have that much Fizz prot and is going to go into a little bit more. Probably a Midgard. And yeah, just full on HP with the Mana Core spikes. So you're going to be feeling the wrath whenever the Colossal Fury comes through. And because of that, 
Yeah, the Gladiators are in a great spot, heading over towards the Primal Fury. They've got three more towers to go through, two of those being Tier 2. And Kirmi's got two Runic Bombs in hand. One of these towers is going to get absolutely destroyed, or maybe save them for a Phoenix. Could do so. One minute left on the Fire Giant buff, so our Phoenix is even a possibility here for the Gilded Gladiators. We'll start with the Tier 2, Scaredy Kirmi tearing up for Tier 1 in mid. It's the last Tier 1 tower standing. Leviathans can't even put up a full defense. The, the Gladiators just split the map on them. They might just clear everything out tower-wise before maybe looking towards a Phoenix. Kirmi may be a bit scared. A final K in Shinto. Shinto is zooming across the map, but it's only going to delay potentially the inevitable. I mean, Scary and Kirmi are just still standing by for this Tier 2. Yeah, but Kirmi's smart because he's got two Runic Bombs. Sure, he could use them on these towers or save them for Phoenix. Either way, he doesn't have to buy wards. You know, he, he can be like, sorry guys, there's just no way. I, I, got, I, got, the Ru play. I got the Runic Bombs, man. You guys got to buy the wards. There's no way I could do it. Tier 2 starts, and Final K does have a wraparound here. Does he to try to get aggressive? No, it's Kirmi who wants to stun on the Fino. Does find the stun. Brutalized after. Final K missed the jump, and Scary D... In the Colossal form, now got to fight off against three. Final K to the back line, but might have been a mistake for Final K. He's losing a lot of HP. Kirmi forced to run as fast as he can, but Typhoon from adapting takes down Kirmi, puts Scary D low, and sets up for Snoopy to find a kill immediately afterwards. Now Stuart taking Lord. one, Zapman the double kill, Zapman the triple kill, and nearly enough afterwards. A triple for Zap, a double for adapting, and the Leviathans have knocked down the Fire Giant Gladiators. I mean, Wrong Yu goes crazy. Though. The fact that he's able to not only kiss Shinto in the midst of that fight, but keep him alive with the undying love. Stewart was almost ready to TP out, but he had such a low target there. He decides to stick around to go for the kill, but that immunity and the pop-off there from all of the Leviathans. A beautiful Typhoon knocks up just about the whole team. So much damage coming from Marty. Zapman pops off. And the Phoenix will go down, but the low health bars tell me it's going to be way too risky to go for the end here. Kirmi's up in five, and that should be enough to say, hey, we get a Phoenix and we back off. Everybody from the Leviathans heading back to base after a full wipe, trading Final K's life for five, plus a left side Phoenix. I mean, that is almost everything you could ask for on the Leviathans, minus just ending the game at that point. And now the tables have turned completely. We're back to an even game, Charlie, that Fire Giant. Effectively nullified by the Leviathans on that team fight. Yeah, gold-wise, but map state-wise, not even at all. I mean, you lose the most important Phoenix. Scary doesn't have Golden Blade, so sending over your, the member of your team with Teleport to try and confirm, not the call. There's no way they decide to commit to this Fire Giant, right? The kill to Gladiator said, hey, we're going to make a pull before the Fire Wave comes in. We have to go now. Starting it up, half HP on the Fire. Final K jumps into the back line. It's not going to scare, oh, to cure me. Fire Giant low, the Gladiators get it, but can they get out of the fight? Kirby jumps in, but it's another Typhoon setup. This one goes a little bit wide, but Kirby is left by himself, raining death from above from Zapman. Scary D nearly gone. Scary D barely makes it out, but Adapting finds the double. And the Leviathans, they don't care about the fire. They're going to win out on the team fight instead. Yep, you lose two, and now stepping forward, up three Gilded Gladiators to try and defend the Phoenix. You get FG on Snoopy inbound and Stewart, but how worth it is it? Doesn't look very. The Phoenix starts dropping shortly, but Snoopy's got some good damage to try and slow the siege. Inbound. Whoa, whoa, inbound. Half his health gone. In the blink of an eye from the combo of Zapman, Shinto teaming up. Inbound throws out a Sunder, does hit one. On the right side, Phoenix. Slowly but surely going down. Almost the same for Fine. Okay, he's chipped down about 10% HP. The Leviathans, they hold through. They knock down two from the Fire Giant buff, and they get themselves yet another Phoenix. They do. Because they weren't able to grab that Fire Giant, the, the rest of the siege might be a little slow here. The Gilded Gladiators will be able to push up left side a little bit. That was a questionable play. Again, they, they knew that their left side bird was down, and if they didn't go right away, then they would have to do a fire mission. So the Gilded Gladiators make a judgment call and say, hey, let's just 50-50 and see if we can get out. Scary D. Colossal Fury just was not enough tank stats. Too much shred comes his way, and he dies. And, of course, losing Kirmi in the process. And a right side Phoenix, definitely not worth it there for the Gladiators, unless they're able to make a play here. Looks like they're not setting up for an ambush. They're setting up for the Primal Fury, but the Leviathans, grouped as four with Wrong Yu still in base, are able to step forward. Final K's got the vision, but the Gladiators are going back to base. I, I assume that's the end of this siege because 
The Leviathans have all the maps, today, but they don't have the buff. And without it, are you really l risking all with all going all the way up to this tier two tower? It's going to be a questionable call, and I think the Leviathans tend to agree. And Final K is saying, "No auto attacks, please." Frostbound, mid Guardian Mail, six slot, plus the corrupted blink as well to slow them down even more. If he does use that blink to the back line, this is the this is the I am done dealing with Stewart and Scary D build. Yeah, I think this is the I'm tired of Vamana build, so <laughs> I'm just I'm going as much as I can to try and make his life miserable. Been doing good damage. Final K is up there, right next to Zapman at the top. And I guess the Manticore spikes, can, you can help, thank for that. Good poke damage from Nike, that's what she brings. But, I was wrong, the Leviathans do feel confident stepping forward. That left side Phoenix is going to spawn here shortly, and no one from the Guild of Gladiators is in position just yet. But the Tier 2 towers with the Leviathans won. Oh, I think a minion wave just caught the fire wave from going into the throne room. But that gives up an opportunity for the Tier 2 tower defense. Leviathans take that one. No towers left on the map, only a mid Phoenix. And about to be a weakened left one respawning in just now. Kirmi is there to try and defend against two. Make that three if Final K holds his own walking over. Kirmi doing his best to try and zone out with the help of Stu. The left side bird gets its full respawn. But there's still one more fire wave on the way in. And the Leviathan's fully strong and healthy to try and push this one down. Yep, they want to go for a siege before the enhanced fire giant spawns in. And they recognize someone has to deal with fire waves over on right soon. They do have one more fire wave on the left as well, which means Final K can tank this up and hopefully one poly shot from Shinto. And that Phoenix goes down, but Kirby's body blocking. Kirby's not going to let this one through. Final K is doing a good job himself. Inbound, having his own against a couple. Scary D versus Zapman and Rong Yu. Can Scary D find the kills he needs? He is chasing it down. Look at the zoom on this Vamana, but he just loses a little bit of distance from Zapman. It could be a turn and burn back. Adapted goes in, finds the pull off of the dash. The Typhoon is there. And Shinto with the shutdown. Yep, plenty of damage, but not enough movement speed, especially when Rong Yu is there. Zapman lives to see another day, and Scary D dies right before Enhanced Fire Giant. Not like the Gilded Gladiators. We're going to step up anyways. They still have that weakened Phoenix over on left and a dead Phoenix over on right. But having your Vamana is a lot better than not having him. Shinto stepped forward, trying to see if he could find anyone clearing a wave, but Snoopy staying relatively far back here underneath this Phoenix. And without Stuart nearby, they've got no clue where Shinto's at, so probably want to watch their positioning, especially with the damage that this Morgan has built already. That Polynomicon proc is going to be essentially doing half of Snoopy's HP. Mid Phoenix, potentially under fire. Wrong, uses so much HP from the poke of Snoopy. Stuart throwing some sh stray shots out, and now an ultimate from inbound calls for a fight, a double stun. Under the Phoenix, it's an ultimate away now from Wrong Yu. Kirmi can't find a bite target. He tries to go back for Wrong Yu, but he can't find it. Zatman taking down inbound, and it could just be Stewart. The dot is not quite enough, but Shinto with the clothesline kill at the end will take down Stu. It's three of the Gladiators to fend off for a full minute against the Leviathans, and Scary D's not got the damage to take anyone out, but he at least keeps them back. Kirmi steps too far forward. Zatman. On a rampage. The Whoa. Leviathan's low. Shinto's got an Aegis out of Snoopy's damage. And that might be just enough for the Gladiators to hold back. Yeah, they want the pick. They want to try and kill Snoopy. But he's the only one who can keep this tight and alive. That AoE damage wow. is keeping the Leviathan's back. But Final K is tanking up the tight. They're going for it. Snoopy still pumping out damage. A nice stance. But there's too much coming from the Leviathan. Snoopy's holding through. Scaredy takes out Zap. But the Gladiators cannot defend. They're tight in the Leviathans in 35, take game one. Yep, one win fight opens the base. The second fire giant pull there from the Gladiators. They said, hey, our base is broken. We have to go for this pull. You end up losing two in the process. And that was enough for the Leviathans to split the map wide open. They were just able to dominate throughout that. They can step up forward. Scary D gets a little bit overzealous. Unfortunately, this Vamana has a fall off point. We've seen it time and time again. You look real good up until about 25 minutes and then you try and catch someone by themselves and the whole team just groups up and destroys you through Colossal Fury. And that's exactly what happened. Scary D just wasn't swinging the way he used to. I mean, we saw just in that last little attempt by him, not at the Titan, but at least at that mid Phoenix where he chases out wrong you and Zapman. And he gets so close so far. And as soon as that minion wave hits, lost out on a lot of the gas pedal at that point, had to back away and then good little pull in by adapting to yank him right back in. The Leviathans start out the set 1-0. Can they keep it and still fight for that second seed spot? We'll find out in game two right after this break.
know it's been a while Haven't accessed your life You've been on my mind Don't hang up I know it's been some time Since I called you mine You've been on my mind Don't hang up Maybe I'm a little bit jealous Haven't told my friends we ended it Yeah, I know that it's wrong Maybe it's a little bit selfish Calling you up when I'm wasted When I know that you moved on Is she in your arms right now? Tell me is she gonna stay the night? Tell me is she in your arms right now? Is she in your arms tonight? Like I used to It's a battle over in the Chaos Division, but in game number one, it's a battle that the Atlantis Leviathans are able to win. This is a game where the Gilded Gladiators probably feel like they had some opportunities. They were able to fight, scrap early, keep themselves in it, but objective fighting just goes a bit awry. Uh, and I have good news for you Smite fans at home and for you V Shoujo fans at home. We've got the V Shoujo crossover going on in Smite right now. And I've got big fans, or big news for those of you who are fans of money. Well, you can buy all the skins right now, everything in the crossover, uh, at the lowest price it'll be in a few weeks. The price will go up. A couple weeks after that, the price will go up again. So, if you want to get your hands on the V Shoujo crossover skins now and for the next couple of weeks is your time to do it. Of course, you can also uh, purchase the V Shoujo chest. Uh, it's a really awesome crossover. It's a great way to support us uh, and some of your favorite VTubers that are out there. Go the Gladiators need your support, though, after game number one. It's a team that has felt a bit of a resurgence, but, Gore, they are at risk of a, a difficult weekend here. The Oni yep. Warriors do Oni Warriors things against the Gladiators earlier this weekend. Game one of this set goes a bit sideways. And it's one that you, you really feel they could have gotten, like you said, the, the plenty of opportunities, hand on the ball could have been there, but couple of things go awry. I'm just going to steal the word from you. When you start to transition into the late game, I think you're going pretty back and forth for a lot of these moments. In fact, I think Scary D, uh, you know, Kirmi, keeping things pretty equal and, and, and even present for the Gladiators side of a lot of this. We got to see a lot of presence, uh, I think, from them in, in I'm going to say, crucial moments early in the game. 
To the point where for a while they were even able to start to have a kill lead. Zap wasn't maybe impacting as heavily as he want. Uh, and then that stopped. Zap started impacting very heavily as the game went on. The team started doing incredibly well, adapting Shinto, get hands-on as well. And once you start to open up, that kind of conversation becomes much easier for the Leviathans to continue their fight. They had a lot of good shred in their composition. And you get great transformations, uh, I think, from the entire squad, right? Shinto being a, someone who is willing to, to get... I guess get his hands dirty is the best way to describe yeah. it, right? He'd get in there, get the job done alongside someone like Zapman, the two of them being able to just absolutely shred health bars. I mean, in a moment like that, what is inbound supposed to do, right? You, you stepped forward, not even out of your Phoenix initially. By the time your abilities were, like, registering and you had decided what you were going to uh, do, you were half health. Gore, 40,000 damage exactly to wow. the number. For Zapman. It's not often we get a nice, well-rounded number like that. It's also not often we get 40,000 damage in a game. <laughs> Unfortunately, he took 24,999 damage, literally one damage away from being a nice even 25,000. But here's the real question. Where could he have gotten the, like, one damage? Hmm... I don't know. Yeah, yeah I don't know enough some dev to, command. Right, right. <laughs> and it, but, you know, as satisfying as seeing an exact 40,000 is, really what that tells us is that I, th this was the – this is why we pick Martiko Ross yeah. game, right? That that was that, That's what this is an example of because it just absolutely melts the Gilded Gladiators. And, Gore, I want to continue this conversation yeah. as we move into P's and B's for game two. Uh Gladiators are in first pick, got to be a consideration after what Zapman just did there in game one. The Marty and, and where you ban it, where you pick it. Um, it's 40,000 damage and a not 40-minute game is a, a pretty steep hill to climb. And that's part of the reason you're picking him, right? I, I think that it's actually interesting to me. A couple of these teams, you know, you look at this week specifically. Uh, we had, what, some Marty bans from the Ravens. Uh, a Marty ban and then a Marty pick, but banned by the Warriors, picked by the Gladiators. He's showing up in a few of these sets, but then you look at like the, the Dragons Warrior set earlier today, and he's not there, right? Suddenly you look at Hounds Kings, and he's there again. I feel like he deserves that presence. I feel like, honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if the Gladiators maybe try to first pick him to take him away, or the Leviathans maybe ban it away. It depends on where the Gladiators are at. They're 0-6 with a Marty on their squad. So, Maybe not the best showing for him, right? Specifically for the Gladiators. Meanwhile, Leviathans have an 80% win rate with him on their team. What you're picking him for, and the conversation we were having with him initially, was da late game damage. You're still picking him for his late game damage, right? 40,000 damage, nothing to scoff at. He does a lot for the team. But before he was competing with Crit, that was the problem. That was the hard part. You saw him go mid most of the time because competing with Crit when you're an ability hunter isn't a good time. And then your team's lacking Crit while the other team has it. Someone's going to be winning that fight, and it was whichever team had the Crit Hunter. Start seeing him shifted over towards mid. You pick up a Crit Hunter, do a double Hunter comp. That's where his balancing point was. Now I feel like he can fit well in mid. He can fit well in duo because what's he going up against? He's going up against the Executioners, the Chin Size, things like that. Nothing that's going to be so heavily hitting that the 1v1s are going to be incredibly difficult and your damage late game is still going to matter, right? Yes, you're not going to be an auto attacker. That's fine. You can find that elsewhere. Maybe, you know, in this case, you can look towards, like, what the Morgan was able to provide as well as what Susano was able to provide. If you're not heavy-handed in the autos, it doesn't matter too much. And so I like what they were able to do with him. I like even more that the Gladiators banned it and were, were trying to, to control that as best they could. Yep. And I like this. Insta-lock the Sirket for Kirmi. Always, always going to be a good look. 60% win right across the league and one of Kirmi's best looks out of the jungle. Won't find me arguing against uh, arguing against that style of pick uh, for the very very talented jungler of the Gilded Gladiators. Vimana being banned away, then maybe he opens up the soul lane conversation. Are you looking at the Guan Yu? Are you looking at the Hercules? What has Fine OK really been enjoying recently? Well, the Nike looked pretty good. Felt like it was able to disrupt the Vimana pretty effectively. Let's play a couple Guan games. Gilgamesh, Horus. It's all been there. But a couple bands from game one now become picks here in game two. Hashiman Yamoja. Quite a strong duo lane for the Levi's. Yeah, honestly, I think that if you're looking and honestly maybe just following a tier list of really strong hunters right now, 
Hachi deserves to be up on that list, right? His recent buffs make him feel real good in lane. Uh, and with Marty gone, I like this pick. It's a good zap pick as well. I feel like he's gone to Hachi in the past and looked really solid on it. Uh, and I'm a big fan of what he's been able to provide for this. Getting the emoji as well. I mean, we had mentioned it. Maybe it's not. Here it is technically in the top five bands for teams when they're against the Leviathans. It's also just a damn good ban or something to get away from wrong you because otherwise you'll get what I assume you're going to see in this game. And I will say, in the past, this pick had like a 100% win rate. He was absolutely insane with it. When it started to falter, it stayed in the 80s. I don't think it's as guaranteed as a win as it used to be, but you no. are still guaranteed that if it's a loss, it's not on wrong you. He looks impeccable on this god. I still would argue one of the best, if not the best, Yamoja in the world. And I think that that's something that, that you're going to have to contend with. Honestly, the people who are giving him a run for his money right now, it's, it's genetics mainly. Yep. And so I think that this is going to be a really good draft for him up in the top three now that we have the Guan Yu on there. Good healing, really good frontline presence, good disengage and engage capabilities. I like the Leviathans and what they've got. I'll admit I like the Gladiators. I don't know if I want to say more. Let's just say as much, right? Terra's really good. I think I prefer personally Yamoja, but Inbound has had some really good games on Terra, really good roots on Terra, things like that. Hercules is absolutely insane. Circuit we had mentioned for Kirmi is just... I mean, it feels like it should be game over. We definitely haven't seen it be a 100% win rate for the Gladiators, but it is such a boost to their gameplay that if you're looking at them scrapping the way they did last time, they're going to play a similar style of game, and, and with this circuit, they could definitely take control. Yep, you would think. Well, we were talking, Gore, Gore about the, the first blood rate of both of these junglers. Kirmi, look again, was able to get it done over on left. Thought might be uh, slowing wrong you down just a bit early in the game there in game one, but Leviathans were able to stabilize, regroup, and get there nonetheless. Imagine Sir Ket will have some of that first blood presence, though, as well. We were just shy of seeing the adapting Thor roll through. Unfortunately, the Gilded Gladiators Baba, yeah, don't want yeah. us to have any fun, and so they'll ban it away. Tiamat also going to follow. But as we've done a couple of times now, Gore, Baba Yaga almost really forgotten easy about to by me. <laughs> Ends up getting locked in again for Shinto, who, got to say, has looked a bit more comfortable today. Yeah. And now that he's here in studio with his team. Oh, and that was the great thing about hearing from Adapting saying, you know, last week he comes in, but we had only had one scrim with him. So, like, what what do you want, right? We, we hadn't been able to do too much with him on or in, like, studio on this, I guess, continent technically, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, you, you have a lot of that that I think really gets to play into it. And then this week you've got more practice with him. He looks really good in the last game on the Morgan. And what I'm really liking is we're getting that flexibility back from the Leviathans. I feel like we saw a few weeks where the picks were very – I mean, they were bland, safe picks that you can play on ping that you don't have to worry too much about. Now you can play the Morgan and get away with it. You can play a Baba Yaga and get away with it. And so I like that the Leviathans are, are starting to feel comfortable again and, and maybe play through their carries the way that we've expected of them. Yep, Leviathans, they got a Leviathans comp. I'll say that. Knew he said Panatom on Susano. Somehow we're five weeks into the year, and I'm still not used to Panatom being on the only Warriors, I guess, uh, adapting on the Susano. Played a good game of Smite there in game number one. Yeah. Look, I've always been a big Discordia fan, namely when BNT, BMT is playing it, but I think provides a lot of great stuff for team, utility, damage. Uh, that passive also wonderful. Maybe if the Guild of Gladiators feel like they were lacking a little extra damage in game one, uh, Discordia will help them out. Yeah, honestly, I think it's going to be, again, a nice little boost to them, right? Hercules more than likely going to hold on to the passive for a little while. But that's no. control, if you no. see the way the lane goes. If you're and Your worst nightmare, I think, if you're the Leviathans, is that Kirimi gets it. And then that Circuit just gets to run even more rampant, right? The taunts already feel really solid. The damage that we get from a Circuit is already insanely good. So you've got great setup for yourself, as well as good chase down potential setup for your team. And then if you're adding any damage on top of that, it becomes a very dangerous game <laughs> that you're going to be playing. Yep. And so I think Kirimi has a good team around him. Going on to, to Discordia as well, that matchup, that 2v2 in mid, right? Susano's got some decent CC. Baba Yaga's got a lot of good damage, and depending on which, you know, I guess special effect of her one you get, could have some some somewhat decent CC, right? I'm thinking of the silences. 
But if I'm looking at Discordia, Strife is like still one of my favorite abilities just to hit. I think in general, you get two people in that and with a Sir Cat beside you, one of them should die almost all the time. So you can go Strife into Taunt, into to the dash, get a triple hit. At that point, what, one auto and really should find the last person. I think there's a lot of potential to CC stack for the Gladiators. And I think if they can CC stack, then on top of that, with the damage numbers they should be outputting, it looks like an early scrap and a very early kill-oriented team. Uh, worth remembering, going into game two here, that while the Chaos side, number one seed is really what we were fighting over for the first three weeks of the phase, it feels like four weeks, Oni Warriors have long since confirmed themselves the first seed coming out of the Chaos side. However, teams two, three, and four, and that's Dragons, Leviathans, and Gladiators, all tied at two wins right now. And, yeah. and that's seeding important for playoffs, and then from playoffs to early week one of Masters. Uh, it, and so this one, if you're looking towards making your seeding a little bit better, you, you could be as low as fourth or as high as second. Leviathan's in a really good spot, though, to close out this set. Game number two, Leviathan's Gladiators. That's right. So much weight on this set for both these teams for implications of second, third, and fourth seed, realistically, on the line for both of these squads. Gladiators, this will be their final game of the phase, Trelly. Last game that they play all the way until the playoffs kick through. Finding a win here in game number two, pushing it to game three. Could potentially, at least be the way the Gladiators want to go. Chat, though. They seem to be leaning a little bit more towards the Leviathans. 72% in the column for Leviathans. You think that's maybe a little bit leaning on the bias of game number one, or you think maybe try some of the composition for Leviathans here in game two has something to do with it? Maybe a little recent, recency bias for sure, because I think that the, the Guild of Gladiators have given themselves what I like to call the Kirmi diff. <laughs> they have they have Kirmi on Sir Cat with a Disco passive. That, that's a pretty solid one-two punch, right? I mean, Kirmi's going to be able to get active so early on, adapting, figuring that aggression, goes into the bead, says, hey, I'm not I'm not getting blink. There's no way I'm getting anywhere near Kirmi on this pick. But can one man hard carry a team? Not likely. And, you know, Stu does get the heal on the start, which is a, certainly a powerful pick as well. I'm curious how the team fight ends up going. But definitely right. I think chat's right to give... Some, some presence over the Leviathans adapting on the Susano. You got Shinto on Baba, which has just been a, a fantastic mid laner as of recent. And double healer with the Emoja Guan Yu. And Zap's just on an ABC. You know, that doesn't count. And Zap. Yeah, hun hunter, hunters are hunters. That's whatever. But in this case, I think the rest of the Leviathans have put themselves in a great position as well. I I'm putting all the weight on Kirmi. Unfortunately for him, he's going to have to pretty much carry the early game. If he is able to get off to a great start with that Discordia passive, Sir Kek can... Absolutely hard carry a game away. We've seen it time and time again. Even Kirmi himself has done it on this pick. You got to get ahead. You got to get like, I don't know, one damage item and a Deathbringer online. And then you just go that sort of hybrid tank so cap build. And then you're able to just pretty much win any 1v1 trade you would like. Yeah, that seems to have been the name of the game for Sir Kets. No longer the glass cannon, no longer the full tank. That kind of in the middle, as you say, get your first damage item on. Maybe a defense, and then that Deathbringer for sure has been slotting in. Gives you so much crit chance once you do hit that level 20. You get mm -hmm. the full percentage of it from the, the Deathbringer, that 30, and then you also get the 30 from the passive. And then Stone of Binding is like protections and damage for Sir yeah. So it's just, it, it's a gnarly combo. There's a reason that Sir is highly prioritized. But in this case, the Leviathans were more worried about the Vamana. They had, they had the option. They're like, Sir Cat or Vamana, and they just said, hey, take away the Vamana. We'll deal with the Sir Cat to see if it comes back to bite him already. Kirmi was hunting and adapting. Followed him to his back camps. Adapting ran as far away from him as possible. As, as you would expect. Again, Susano just does not get the better end of these trades early on. And Kirmi knows that. He wants a first blood. He wants to finish Transcendence first. And he figures, hey, easiest way to do it, I find adapting or I go over to duo lane. And so now for the Leviathans. How will their early game fare for themselves? Adapting, maybe waiting for that level 5, that first item online. Get that Typhoon. It's coming so big for his team in game number one. A couple of huge pickups there. I think a couple of three-man, a couple of two-man ultimates throughout some of those late-game team fights. Really get things rolling. For the Leviathan, Shinto. I wonder if we'll be seeing the Prophetic come from him. We've seen a few players go towards the Prophetic build. You get usually two damage items. Then that defense, just because of how easy you can stack it. Sometimes maybe going as late as that fourth item. I wonder if Shinto will just forego it entirely and say, you know what, I've got my frontliners. They'll build the Azores for me. 
Maybe he just goes a full damage route. That's what I've been saying. I mean, but if, if Pagan's not going to do it, I don't think Shinto's going to do it, right? It's I was like, you know, the, the, the Warriors were winning so much, and the Baba Yaga still third out in Prophetic Cloak. So I, I, I've got a feeling it's just the smarter call. You just stack it up so freely, and Shinto will have that, that extra level of safety. But so far, Ultimate's coming through just for the solo laners and the mid laners. I guess Adapting has access to that Typhoon, but hasn't tried to use it just yet. I'm wondering, because, again, Scary D has been one to use his ultimate pretty freely over in lane, whether that be for totem confirmation or just any sort of aggression he can find. But it looks like dual lane is the call. Sadman just takes over to level 5, though. Not going to be able to fall there. That was a clutch timing, but here comes Adapting for the regank. Wrong you trying to keep Cure Me nearby, but not able to hold him back. Rumors Rebuke on to Stu. He's got nowhere to go. Wild Hunt. On top of two, but Adapted goes in with the ultimate, and that will be a first blood for Leviathan. But the turnaround by Kirmi is almost there. He uses his ultimate up against Zapman. And Wrong You and Zap, they'll take the Riptide out. And the Leviathans will make out with their first blood of the game. Just right around that four-minute mark. Yeah, unfortunately, Kirmi was not able to find that ultimate onto Adapting. So he gets the beads down, but no kills for his trouble. And that's going to be the end of the aggression, unless Shinto gets caught out here, probably uses the beads and just drops the ult. Maybe he doesn't even have to ult. Yeah, Kirmi didn't have the death bane, so there really was no threat. Home sweet home, not necessary. Kirmi just cannot dish that amount of DPS without his ultimate or without that death bane. So this Baba Yaga, a growing problem, but the beads pulled. So maybe opens up some more aggression later on once Snoopy and Kirmi finish up full items. I do love that aggressive play, though. I mean, immediately caught out. There's a reason wrong. You doesn't get to play Yamoja very often. Stewart steps forward, gets caught out, and that just starts the aggression train here for the Leviathans with that first blood onto adapting. I wonder then, Charlie, how fast that maybe expites the necessity of, of a phantom shell, because tier one of it already picked up by inbound, but already seeing that right at that level five mark that it's starting to get value with that ultimate. Do you think that maybe kind of elevates the degree uh, of danger that maybe forces inbound to pick that up a little bit faster. Usually, if it's a different relic, I see upgrades almost immediately, but when it's Phantom Shell in particular, these support players like to forego trying to upgrade it, maybe because it's very rare that you're going to be able to find that aggression. Scary D does not have the boulder. Let's see how much CZ they can put towards this Hercules. A good bit of damage. Adapting picks up his second kill of the game. And that's just the, that's the reason you got to save that CC immunity. When you, if you don't have a boulder, you're going to get chain stunned from the cavalry charge. And that thing makes short work of that second gank. This time, final K, Garvin, an assist. 2-0 now. The king out of the jungle, adapting on the Susano, stacking up the transcendence, working towards Hydra's, it seems to maybe be the next call for him. That's a lot of extra burst damage that can come for adapting. Six minutes in, though, is not quite... The pacing may be expected for the Leviathans. I mean, you got a Baba, you want to wait towards Lei. You got a Yamoja, Great Lake, Guan Yu, same. But maybe at that same time, it's right exactly where Leviathans want to be. I mean, talking to, uh, to Adapting, says the Guild of Gladiators are great early. Got to try and fight them early if we want to get those wins. Getting a couple of picks and a couple of kills for Adapting this early in, probably the best thing that they could call for. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, that, that, that's who I'd be wanting my kills on. If I could choose someone on this squad, it is get ahead, Adapting. Certainly want to be able to make that impact, and he has not been taking it lightly. He's able to go over to the right side and make sure Scary D gets put down, and he's still hovering around that solo lane for the time being. Scary D's probably not going to throw that excavate just for any wave clear anymore. He's probably going to hold on to that CC immunity just to make sure that the cavalry charges in a guaranteed death every time he steps by. But with the cooldown buff coming back, Adapting is going to hover around the solo lane. Is he looking for the fight, though? Depends on how scary to use his driving strike. Scaredy he doesn't know. To it. No, he uses boulder. While there might not be the dash, it's a little hard for adapting to be able to chase through with that anyways. And a shield of regrowth on it. Scary D, he's going to move pretty fast away with the help of that heal. So a little skirmish potential, at least around the cooldown buff, but it's going to wash out and fade to nothing at this point through. Is that man on the Hachiman this game? Feels like a classic pick for him. We've already seen the damage capabilities of this Hachi with the buffs that came to him in this patch, the extra attack speed, at least afforded to him in this passive, the extra damage that his first ability does. Man, when you get hit by one of those Hachi snipes now, you really start to feel the pain. Oh, yeah, and that's slow. It's just a great engage or disengage tool here for the Leviathans at any given moment. Kirmi stepped over, saw there was no attempt at a gank, and just leaped away. Unfortunately, 
I've been talking about the the early pressure that Serket can provide, and Kiriness has not been able to get too aggressive. I mean, you get some damage on the Shinto, get home sweet home, that's going to be the end. At the very least, you get a green buff invade attempt, and wasn't even able to find that, so green buff still goes down, and Shinto just trades ult for ult. And Kimmy really needs that aggression, right? The blink is gone, your CC immunity is gone, and you get nothing really worthwhile when Shinto's got 20% CDR already with the Sands of Time and the Spear of Death. So, inbound soul with an auto. He took, he took purple buff away with a single in hand, away from Wrong You and Zapman. Not great for them now losing out on that experience with the purple, but maybe not the end of the world. And speaking of XP, slightly in favor. I mean, ever so slightly here for the Gladiators. Gold. Just barely up about four or five hundred for the Leviathans. Start this one out. Maybe I expe expected, though. I mean, it's only been first blood, plus one extra kill for adapting. No objectives really up at that time for them to go for immediately after. No buffs to go towards an invade. So, farming efficiently across the map for both of these two teams. That only real lead, pretty much at this point, just coming from that first blood bounty. But the Cold Fury started up by the Gilded Gladiators. Three stack at the pit, make it four now with the rotation in from Snoopy, but once the Leviathans are spotted through, the Gilded Gladiators will pull away from the objective. They certainly will. I like the attempt. You're just trying to check response time, right? Let's pull the objective, see if they show up. Adapting is there immediately. So you got to assume either A, the vision was ready, or the Leviathans just know, hey, we got to make sure we're watching this Gold Fury so it doesn't get snuck anytime soon. Final K doesn't have any sort of teleport available where a Scary D does, so maybe the Hercules is able to clear out a wave, go back to base, upgrade, and show up immediately. That could be a play the Gilded Gladiators go for. Just because they don't have too much burst and too much frontline without this Hercules rotating through. It doesn't seem like that's the call. I mean, it's been a lot of slow farming. We already know how much is on the line for both of these teams standing-wise. Of course, first seed is just gone with the win, but any sort of win, important to grab here, especially at the end of the phase. And because of that, no overstepping. No risky pulls. It's been a lot of calculated farm and mostly a whole lot of just standing here looking at each other. I mean, second seed's so important. Sure, first seed for this division, as mentioned on the desk, as mentioned prior. Out of reach for both these teams, so that fight for third, or I should say that fight for second, maybe the most crucial one that these two teams can try and go for here because it means that you get a much better path potentially, at least for the playoffs. That bracket between the two divisions having to play off against each other during that time, then eventually leading up into the Masters event later on down the road as well. But definitely great practice for these two teams up against each other to maybe kind of get themselves prepped up for that playoff kicking off in just a couple of weeks as well. Atlantis Leviathans had a hot, hot start in game number one. Now the Gilded Gladiators need to answer back here in game two. Inbound playing aggressive again, but there's three around here, but that monolith prevents the pull from adapting, and inbound can dash right out. Unsuccessful on the steal this time, though. Inbound loves going for that purple buff in particular. Like the, I've seen a lot of supports go for that play, as the Gilded Gladiators are going to step up for the Pyromancer, but Shinto's here has plenty of burst potential. It's going to go for an attempted steal. As here comes Fine OK. Fine OK charging in. Gladiators get the Pyromancer. Fine OK dies on Snoopy, but look how much damage he took. Just getting to the back line, though, the home sweet home from Shinto. Doing a lot to Scary D, adapting, trying to 2v1 in the back line. And now Kirmi is here, and it's a turnaround kill for the Gladiators. Their first one of the game. And now it's Final K and Shinto on the run as inbound tries to close in the gap. Doesn't have the wall, doesn't have a dash, but what? Scary D? Maybe didn't get the memo. The rest of the Gladiators, they're done fighting. But it looks like Rong Yu's not done. He's going to step forward. The rest of his team is here. And inbound gets body blocked into the River's Rebuke. How much damage comes towards the Terra with a double dash away? It looks like not enough. But Rong Yu still wants to dive here. Fine, OK. Under the tower, Zapman oh, rotates why. in. And Zapman gets the kill. But how much can Stuart return fire back with? A wild hunt expended. But it's a dive under Tier 1. Two down for a Pyromancer for the Gladiators, as well as one single pick they got. But it's the Leviathans. I mean, they're turning it back. No pressure further to the Tier 1 tower. Jelly, we're back to nearly an even game. Yeah, it seemed like both of these solo laners ended up making the same call here. As Zapman gets chunked down, doesn't have the ultimate, but a riptide. Unless the... Oh, oh no, my the goodness! Bounce. The bounce by Snoopy! I was going to say, unless the apple can connect and that wall said, I got you. The apple comes through, but fine. Okay, still wants to try and chase down Kirmi. Can you find the stun? No. That should be the end. And Snoopy's going to say he planned that, Calculated. but I'm not buying it. All wrong you had to do was step like 
Like one, like one footstep backwards, and he takes that apple. But instead, it's Zap Man. That's they a. Say, they say an apple a day keeps the doctor away, but I think in this case he's gonna have to go to the doctor after that one hits. I, I, I wouldn't be going. I, I, you just saw Zap. Zap just looked into the, his table and just said, <sighs> "It was just an exhale." He was so upset that that apple actually came his way. He's like, "Ah, oh, man." Makes him almost feel like Barracuda with Giannis Snipes at this point. <laughs> He's just the magnet for Discordia Apples at this point. Atlantis Leviathans, though, still holding on to a very small lead, even despite the Pyromancer, even despite a couple of kills now going over to the Gilded Gladiators. XP also still just nudging its way back towards the Gladiators, who will once again make an aggressive play around Fury. But if you're going for a heat check, wrong Yu's already here. Kirmi now, how far is he stepped out of position? He'll be able to dash just out. Doesn't have beads. Remember, only blink for Kirmi. Still down for five seconds. So this next team fight, maybe lacking a defensive relic, and maybe now realizing that Kirmi going to take a step back with the rest of his team. Yeah, probably a smart call. These heat checks from the Gilded Gladiator show they do want to scrap. They do want to fight. They just haven't given the opportunity to because of how slow it takes to actually burn through that, that Gold Fury and how risky of a call it is to go for the 50-50, especially when both of your solo laners are just not ready to make that rotation. I have been liking this aggression, though. Kirmi, as you said, doesn't quite have that second relic, so might want to stay a little further back, because Adapting's got the blink, he's got the beads, and he's got that Hydra's online. This Susano is doing tons of damage. He's able to get to the back line and get some of those auto attack cancels through with this with his kit. But hasn't had an opportunity to do so because no one wants to fight. It's the pull. Are they going to show up? No? All right, let's back up. We want we want a free objective, but we're not going to scrap for it. Not without Scary D. And because of that, the Kilda Gladiators are just going to go back to farming. Stu, slight lead over Zapman inbound, just ahead of Wrong Yu. It's really only adapting on the side of Leviathans who have any kind of XP lead over the Gladiators. Meanwhile, it's Gladiators across the board almost everywhere else. Or some slight farm leads that way. Scary D, he'll actually full purchase not just the Heart Ward, but it's upgraded Glyph as well. So first three items are Scary D. The regrowth makes sense. We've been seeing Heart Ward also pop its way back into the meta for Solo. And now this Phalanx with its buff coming up, we've been seeing it a little bit more recently with some of those change-ups through. But we haven't really seen on an actual, like, basic attack base style of God. It's mostly just been on these warriors who don't want to get hit by the Hunters. See if maybe he can put it to use here at the Gold Fury. Gilded Gladiator's got it down to half HP. Snoopy's going to be there secure, but maybe Final K and Rolling You won't give him a chance. Double up in from the frontliners, pulls the Fury back through. Boulder doesn't connect. The Leviathans take the Fury away. And now Final K up on the horse. He'll go in, find the Sun onto one while Adapting chases out Kirmi. Zatman crashes the party and Adapting with the Typhoon takes down inbound. Scarity on the run. But how far can one Hercules run? Not very far when the Leviathans are chasing you down. I mean, the Gilded Gladiators do, they go for the pull, they get it, I would say 20% and then go, eh, we didn't, we were just joking. We didn't really want to confirm this objective. It's too late. Now the Leviathans are able to just pick it up and then find the fight adapting. Wins the 1v1 with Kirmi handedly, forces the Circuit away and still able to make a huge splash in that team fight with the Typhoon after. Big plays in favor of the Levi's, and they're not done. They're going to go for the Pyromancer as well. Get a Runic Bomb in tow and just control the map. Look at where the team is. They don't have their ADC over here. They don't have they don't have the jungle over here. They're spreading out the farm as much as possible. Zatman and Adapting keep trying to spread that lead. And it looks to me like they're waiting to see if Stuart's going to walk up. Take a look at his relics. He has them both available, but they're going to go for the dive here. And Stuart spots it out. Stuart takes a peek around the corner, says, Well, there's two people there. I guess I'm going to sit. Right by my tier two tower. That's exactly where Stewart will make his path towards. Lance Leviathans have now opened the door for themselves. Their first significant lead of the game. About three, three and a half thousand gold up. Look at that spike down in XP as well. 6k up for the Leviathans. Now firmly solidifying at least Adapting's lead in the jungle. And Zatman for the first time this game also taking a lead over Stu. Yep. Kami is having some troubles. Trying to get aggressive. He doesn't have that crit online yet. Missed the mark with the early... CC potential that Sir Cat provides, and because of that, I'm thinking he needs to just go for the split push route. I mean, that, that is a good time if you can just find, hey, oh, they're on the left side of the map. Okay, I'm going to go get some waves. Like, just, just give up Gold Fury, give up Pyromancer. I'm going to be on the opposite side of the map. It's what a lot of these junglers go to when they start to fall behind. They recognize that, A, 
They are one of the most impactful characters on a map, period. Like, Smite is so controlled by how much damage your junglers can do. And because of that, you see adapting more often than not, just hovering around solo lane, trying to get free farm whenever Final K rotates out. But in this case, Kimmy's not doing that. He's not, he hasn't been farming at all. He's been hiding in the jungle, waiting to get aggressive. He's been level 14 since we started this conversation, and it doesn't seem like he's going to be getting too much farm in the meantime. No, meanwhile, adapting able to put up an extra level for himself. Mid laners at level 18 apiece, and it will be a third item prophetic cloak for Shinto. So going to stack up the defense while Kirmi tries. Take down Zapman, ult to slow down too. And now Final K, he's got a horse of his own. Wrong Yu actually cuts away Stewart from this fight. And it's Final K versus Snoopy. Kirmi in three gladiators versus Wrong Yu, but they can't even lock down the Yamoja. Final K goes through, eats the apple from Snoopy. I mean, that opens the door now for Shinto to start barreling his way through. The Firebolt's in, Typhoon will clip through three, adapting, kills off one with the damage. Shinto takes down another. Inbound, nowhere to go. It's one for Zapman, spreading the love across the entire team. While Kirmi can do nothing but run from Shinto, the five level down Sir Ket from the mid. Kirmi, he's, he's waiting for cooldowns and nearly gets clipped. The Leviathans get three and a tier two under their sights. I just don't understand the play there. Well, why are the Guild of Gladiators, given the map state, given their XP, given their gold, trying to force a fight on left. They, they, they blink on the zap, get his ultimate, but because Wrong Yu makes that beautiful play and keeps everyone around with the ultimate, that means that the rest of the Leviathans are able to come in. And look at this, Phoenix. Some good fight potential, but Scared E, he's got some pullback. Pushes one, gets knock up on one, and Boulder only onto a single target. Phoenix, though, still stands as inbound, finds a couple with his own stun, but Kirby gets yanked back in, and the Riptide pulls back two more, adapting and zap. Split a couple of kills between each other, and now it's another three-man defense by the Gladiators. But is it really three when Shinto up in the house is forcing the Gladiators back at their own Phoenix line? Left side bird gone 20 minutes in. Again, just did not seem like a fight that the Gladiators needed to take. They had plenty of time to just split push. Scary D, that's what he was doing. He was clearing while the rest of his team was losing a 4v5 over on the left side of the map. And because of that, tries to show up, tries to defend the bird and ends up dying for that overcommitment. Now the Leviathans get to grab an Oni Fury, probably head back to base, spend up some of that gold. And we're in Fire Giant territory. I mean, a Phoenix has already dropped 20 minutes in before the Fire Giants even looked at. But there are no Rudic Bombs in play, so Pyromancer still impactful here for the Leviathans. And inbound, trying to stop some backs for the time being. The rest of his team is gone. He is here strictly to be annoying. Inbound nearly clips him with a basic attack, just a quarter second shy of that one going through but now the Leviathan's all back to base and spending up all the gold they had in pocket there now 7,000 nearly 8k up for Leviathan's fire giant on the map and available Leviathan's did all that push without that objective I can only imagine what they're able to do with it at this point I think you're right to say though Charlie just so such a questionable decision by the gladiators to stand so far up having their tier one tower down Trying to kill a wrong you of all people who's so tanky at this point. It cost them everything on the left side of the map before. Might just cost them a fire giant now after because of it. Leviathans with no contest. No one on the gladiator stepping up. There'll be fire giant on all five and their continued siege. They've got a couple of towers left in mid to go through. One on the right side of the map. Add a pyromancer in a pocket. It'll make their siege that much easier. Certainly will. Got that left side bird down, but inbound Stewart able to grab a tier two of their own. Got to hurry up and channel those backs or else Final K might be able to stop them, and he won't. So at the very least, the Guild of Gladiators get a little bit of extra gold in their pockets. Adapting wants to try and fight Scary D here, I'm guessing, or seeing who else will step forward in this case. So yeah, those Oni minions are not going to die anytime soon. This is where that, that Golden Blade Hercules build really pays off. But Kirmi stepping forward in the jungle. And again, it does seem like Adapting wants to take the 1v1. I don't think it's going to go too well, especially underneath the tower. But stalling the Hercules is some merit. And it looks like just pushing slowly here. I don't think the Leviathans need to be this split. In fact, Final K is pushing a lane that already has fi fire minions. So it doesn't seem like the smartest call. And Kirby tries to take advantage. Does try and grab Rong Yu. The apple does manage to clip right at the end. But Rong Yu is still alive. Kirby is gone in an instant. And a Typhoon gets two different ages from the backliner. Scary D walks up. But it's the last moment that he gets to have. Inbound gets dropped by adapting this time. Five in a row for the king. Six kills for Zapman this game. Try Leviathans. 
They may just be one moment away from walking through and ending this one out. A Runic Bomb on Phoenix, but a low HP wrong you. It might be the only thing that slows them down. It's up to Stewart and Snoopy to defend against four. Adapting to the back line. Stewart, quarter HP in the fountain. Snoopy forced back. The Leviathans, they'll walk right into the throne room. There's nothing the Gladiators can do to stop this one. And it's the Leviathans who take it in two. Yep, if you're putting up six kills on Susano and Hachi, man, your gameplay is looking real solid. Again, some questionable plays there. The Gladiators were able to keep the gold relatively even. They just could not put up those kills. Unfortunately for Kirmi, this the circuit that really excels in those early ganks just wasn't able to find anything, whereas adapting on the Susano knew exactly how to get to the back line. He knew exactly where he was able to find his aggression, and because of that, the whole team was able to get ahead. Even when the gold wasn't that massive, XP was always a factor. Adapting does one thing really well, and that's farm the map. Yeah, I mean, it, it really just felt like Kirmi spent so much of that time for the first 10 or so minutes trying to find where he wanted to gank, trying yep. to set up for an opportunity instead of maybe just pull the trigger and go for it. Just jump into the lane, throw out a taunt, see if you get a set of beads. Meanwhile, adapting, as you say, just starts making plays across the map, farms it up well. And it's the Leviathans in two who take down the Gilded Gladiators. That's it for me and Charlie on the cast. We'll throw it to the desk to break it down. Struggles continue for the Gilded Gladiators and maybe a turning of the fates now for the Leviathans. Goodness, when their stuff is on the screen in the back, that's a serious storm where we're sitting in here. The <laughs> lightning strikes really light up the room. Uh, Gore standings wise, this important for the Atlantis Leviathans. They now in soul, they are now in sole possession of second place. Yep. Gilded Gladiators, that was their last set of the phase, and so the Gilded Gladiators cannot jump up into second place. Some, th some things could shift around depending on how the Jade Dragons end up looking um, tomorrow in their matchup. Uh, but the Atlantis Leviathans, a big win to, to you know, maybe sp spin some things around, if nothing else, boost the mental a bit going up against the Jade Dragons tomorrow. Um, and, and at the moment, in sole possession of second seed yeah. over in Chaos. Honestly, it's a team that you've been expecting to do well. I think we... Honestly, you, you've got to talk about the fact that Shinto wasn't around for a while, right? And obviously, with them looking better this set, it feels like solid upgrades. Last week to this week, you definitely are getting a cleaner Leviathans. But I do think there's still going to be some conversations around them and, and what they're going to look like at playoffs, what they're going to look at, like going into Masters, right? I think Zap's tweet, I don't think it's necessarily a far-fetched idea. I think this is a team that when they're all together, play really well, and I feel like the growth that we've seen just in one week of having Shinto back here, all of a sudden you get back into the flow of things. You finally get the full team practice, right, with adapting, find okay kind of joining in. I feel like that potential is there, the ceiling is there, and this was a good showing for him. I think if you go 2-1 this set, there's still a lot of question marks around that, right? Whether or not the team is, is as strong as they could be or as they have been in the past. You go 2-0 here, depending on how you play against the Dragons as well, then suddenly maybe you're 2-0 there. And, and I think you've definitely been able to turn around maybe some sentiment about how things have been going in the Chaos Division. Especially when the, the game two was as fast and as convincing as it was in this set. Gore, we haven't seen many games ending shy of 30 minutes so far this phase, much less one that barely creeps over that 20 minute mark. Uh, Zap does like 40K damage in game, not like, literally exactly 40,000 damage to the dot in game number one and put up another good performance in game number two. He's also standing by with J-Mac for the post game interview. Yeah, that's right. I've got Zapman carry for the Atlanta Leviathans here with me. First off, Zapman, congrats on the 2-0 over the Gladiators. Now that your season is coming to a close, still got one more set up against the J-Dragons tomorrow, I believe, first set of the day. How's it kind of feel for your team to finally start pulling in some of these wins and start getting yourself prepped over for the playoffs? Yeah, it feels good. I mean, Gore mentioned it on the desk earlier where Shinto, this is the first full week of practice we had with Shinto uh, here in the States. So we feel really good. We've been playing really well in scrims. And, you know, it's not it's not how you start, it's how you finish. So we're, we're looking forward to the playoffs and uh, we think we're, we're going to do well. Yeah, it's case now, you know, regular season Zapman's done. Now we're starting to get to that playoff territory. And do you feel for your team now that kind of build up? You've got Shinto here, you got your good scrims in. You're gonna have, you know, a week off after this to get that extra practice. Do you feel that extra bump is what's really gonna elevate your team as you move into playoffs? Yeah, definitely. I mean, Shinto's a big player for us. You know, he has a lot of charisma and you know, when he's going, we're all going. So having him here has just been it's been great and we're just looking forward. Yeah. And and, and talk to me a little bit, you know, 
keep at least the core three of your former Leviathans team with you, you know, keeping Shinto, keeping Wrong Yu, now having adapting and Final K join to your roster. How's it been kind of, you know, meshing with these two new players and kind of get them to fit into what was the Leviathans old play style? Yeah, I mean, it's pretty seamless. I mean, those guys, they're, they're veterans of the league, you know, adapting two time. Final K has just been always on a, on a dominant team winning. So it's been pretty seamless. I mean, the big issue for us is just, uh, kind of, I guess, they, do, they obviously fit in, but as, as a whole, we kind of just were a little bit lost with the meta, I think, and, and just trying to find play styles that, uh, you know, do well with us. Also, like, you know, we would scrim something and then draft something else in SBL, or we'd do right. something dumb. We lost a lot of coin flips, too. You know, I think actually we would have beaten the Warriors if, if Divine Rune didn't steal our Fire Giant in Game 3. Oh, just man, just going to put that out there, you know. So uh, <laughs> we're gunning for them, and uh, we're just really excited to play. It's been a really fun season so far. Hey, you got one more set to go and a final one for you. How do you feel about your matchup against the Jade Dragons tomorrow? Oh, we're confident. We're always confident, you know. Um, we're, just, we're looking forward to it. We want to close out strong. All right. Well, it was a good win for you today, Zatman. Congratulations on the big win. I'll let you back with the team. We'll throw back to Des to close it out. Thank you. Matchup against the Jade Dragons tomorrow, yep. Gore, ends up being very important now for the Atlanta Leviathans. The Leviathans beat the Jade Dragons earlier on in the phase. Should the Jade Dragons beat the Leviathans tomorrow, they'd be tied in head-to-head, -head, in which case we'd have to go into plus-minus and all those sorts of things. Uh, if the Leviathans win, then it's simple. They're in sole possession of second place in the Chaos Division. Uh, look, Zatman, of course, always very well-spoken. Does a very good job of doing like the coach-player-speak type interviews, you know. Um, but he does, I think, have a lot of correct notes coming out of the interview yeah. it's not about how you start it's about how you finish of course that that's i mean that's been the leviathan's mo for a couple of years right they kind of fumble around in the early phases and then look pretty strong down I mean, the stretch that's just the way things have been for zapman last year is the exact thing right we come into phase one and we're like these are the world champs are we are we sure they're the same guys like let's check people behind the computers match up they did incredibly well though as you mentioned, as the year went on, right? Phase one, a little, little shaky, a little sloppy. Phase two, a little cleaner. Phase three, they set a record going in 11 yep. streaks that was then beat by the Kings immediately after. That's now been beat by the Warriors immediately after. But I think that they are a team that, like you said, if they start feeling hot, it, it starts looking worse for the rest of the league. Yep. And I'm nervous for the rest of the league if that's the case. A lot of competitive teams this year. Uh, let's see. Uh, just exactly what we have to look forward to tomorrow. Really bookending our day with some really important set score. And the set in the middle, uh, important for, for the order side. Uh, and the, the set at the end, very important for the order side. The chaos division shakes out a bit more clearly tomorrow morning, though. Of course, the Oni Warriors completely confirmed. They're your number one seed, undefeated. 10-0 team. The Jade Dragons and the Leviathans will battle it out. Uh, and in just a moment, you'll see the standings and why we're so keen on that Kings versus Ravens set. Because if the Kings win that, suddenly they're tied with the Ravens. And then you have to look at the head-to-head -head between the teams. The Eldritch Hounds also play tomorrow. So there's a chance that tomorrow, if the Hounds win and the Kings win, we have three teams tied at first at six and four. But I don't think the Hounds would have t the head-to-head tiebreakers. We'll, we'll have to do all this math tomorrow, and we'll bring it to you tomorrow and, and, and have the correct answers. But there is a world where we're going into tiebreakers yeah. for the order division. Now, none of this could matter if the Ravens yep. just win. They just win. <laughs> but, then you're, but then we're still potentially looking, and if the Hounds lose and the Kings lose, and you're looking at tiebreakers for second, third, and Fourth seed. There's a world yeah. where the Kings drop to five and five, the Hounds drop to five and five, and the Ferrymen improve to five and five. There will be some types of tiebreakers somewhere on the order side, uh, and then over on the Chaos Division, if the Leviathans win, they're uh, they're in sole possession of the second seed. If the Jade Dragons yep. win, um, then you're starting to look at plus minus because yep. the head to head would be split there. So first set of the day, last set of the day, and, and really <laughs> potentially the middle set of the day and determining all the other tiebreakers uh, comes down to the final day of the phase score. And that's where all of those game wins really start to matter, right? Going into this week, Kings had a six plus minus. So that's That feels really good considering everybody else in that division uh, outside of the Ravens. I guess I should just say Ferryman uh, and Hounds, but the Ravens were at two. The yep. other two were at one, right? So you've got to – Pretty big cushion if that comes down to the, I guess, deciding factor. Those cushions can disappear pretty quickly with two O's, though, right? All yeah. of a sudden, you're down two more points, maybe down four more points, and you're right in there with the dregs on everybody else. Gore, the Leviathans end our day with a 2-0 win over the Gilded Gladiators. They will start our day with a matchup against the Jade Dragons tomorrow. That one, again, 
for possession of second seed on the chaos side. That's it for our broadcast here today. On behalf of myself, Gormizer, everyone back in production, all the other casters, thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you tomorrow.